Good morning, Evangel. Here we are again. It's Sunday. You're at home in your comfy chair with your tiny little screen. And here I am in my office or somewhere around town spouting off about what we really need to keep our focus on and keep our attention drawn to right now. I can say right off the bat that I feel like God is doing some significant things in your hearts and in my heart. And I think that we are going deeper with God. We are creating a significant connection with the vine. Today, I'd like to talk to you about prayer, in specific, our prayer for each other. I've been spending quite a bit of time in Colossians this week, looking at how Paul interacts with his people, the church, as an apostolic leader. And I think I've really found some significant um, keys to our relationships with each other in prayer. And so I'd like to share that with you today. And I'm going to start by reading Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. This is what it says. Since we first heard about you, we've kept you always in our prayers, that you would receive the perfect knowledge of God's pleasure over your lives, making you reservoirs of every kind of wisdom and spiritual understanding. We pray that you would walk in the ways of true righteousness, pleasing God in everything you do. Then you will become fruit-bearing branches, yielding to his life, and maturing in the rich experience of knowing God in his fullness. And we pray that you would be energized with all his explosive power from the realm of his magnificent glory, filling you with great hope. Your hearts can soar with joyful gratitude when you think of how God made you worthy to receive the glorious inheritance freely given to us by living in the light. He has rescued us completely from the tyrannical rule of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom realm of his beloved son. For in the son, all our sins are canceled and we have the release of redemption through his very blood. That's Colossians chapter one, verses nine through 14 in the Passion Translation. It's widely believed that Paul wrote this letter from prison in Rome around 62 AD, or about 29 years after Jesus' death. He had never been to this city, at least it's thought he'd never been to this city, but he had been in Ephesus for about three years, uh, establishing the church there and teaching and preaching there. And while in Ephesus, his message and his reputation became known throughout all of that portion of Asia. And so it's believed also that um, during that time, Epaphras, who was a church planter in that area, had taken Paul's message to Colossia and established a church there. Paul's love for the people in Colossia had actually originated in his heart and his relationship with Epaphras. And so he was writing this letter from Rome to encourage them and strengthen them and keep them, try to keep them from falling into the hands of false prophets and false teachers which were, uh, false teaching was running rampant during that time. So as I was reading this letter, it hit me how, <laughs> how different Paul's prayers were to mine. When I pray, it sounds uh, a lot different than the way Paul prayed. Um, it, it's kind of embarrassing in a way because I realize my prayers are much more generic. They're much more um, simplistic. And when I listen to the way that Paul wrote to the church in Colossia, it's, uh, it's striking the depth of his understanding of what he was praying for, what he was expecting, and what he's wanting for these people. So when we're praying for each other, it sounds something like this. Let's say we're praying for physical healing. It sounds something like this. Jesus, you're the great healer. I ask that you pour out your healing and power on my friend. Bring everything in their body, body into perfect alignment. And move everything that stands in the way of perfect health out of the way. I ask you to heal my friend. That's what a typical prayer would sound like. Or maybe if we're praying for finances, we would pray something like this. Father, all we need is in your hands. You know what my friend's financial needs are. And there's no limit to your ability to meet their needs. I ask you to open the floodgates of provision and meet every financial need uh, my friend has. So that's kind of maybe what a, a prayer would sound like that we would pray for somebody in financial need. Suppose we were asked to pray for somebody for a job. We may pray something like this. You know my friend's heart, Lord. They are hungry to get back to work, work and provide for their family. 
They simply need the job that will open the door for that provision. I ask you to open that door for them and give them the perfect job. Or suppose we're praying for spiritual breakthrough for someone. We may pray a prayer that sounds something like this. Holy Spirit, you are the source of our spiritual strength. You see what we don't see and you know what we don't know. And you're able to do what we cannot do. So breathe on my friend's relationship with Jesus with such power that they're catapulted forward into the God-designed destiny that you have for them. You know, this is the, these are the type of prayers we might pray for each other. You may pray a little differently than I do. You may pray in a more specific way, but uh, we all tend to generalize our prayers when we pray for each other. These are not necessarily bad prayers. In fact, they're actually pretty direct, focused, and insightful prayers. They're not vague or lacking in faith, but they don't necessarily have much vision to them. They don't really speak to the person's destiny like um, Paul does here. And so we're going to look at that and look at how he approaches prayer and look at how he prays for people he really cares about, like we pray for each other, and see if there's something we can learn today. Uh, the question is, what would it look like for us to pray for each other in a way that had vision attached to it? Well, let's see if we can learn from this. So, Paul starts out by saying, Since we first heard about you, we've kept you always in our prayers. I mean, what a father's heart Paul has. We've kept you in our prayers. So he's, these prayers are coming out of a father's heart, out of a pastor's heart, out of, out of the heart of someone who cares about their, uh, who these people are and who they're becoming. So here's what Paul's praying for these people to receive. And I've kind of taken the liberty of framing it in a way that speaks to me because I was studying the scripture and I was receiving a ton from uh, Paul's prayer and the way he was praying it. And I just thought today I would share that with you. So the first thing he says is, receive the perfect knowledge of God's pleasure over my life. He's praying for me that I would receive the perfect knowledge of God's pleasure over my life. What, it would, be, what would it be like to know God's pleasure over my life every day? every hour, every minute. What does God's pleasure look like? And if that was something we could discover and we could pray for each other, I might pray for you. Let Help them discover today, Lord, what your pleasure is like, the depth of your pleasure, the perfect knowledge of your pleasure over their life. The second thing you can see in here, the second thing that he prays is that we be made a reservoir of every kind of wisdom and spiritual understanding. So this isn't about being the smartest guy in the room. This isn't about being full of knowledge and full of understanding. This reservoir that he's talking about is something that, a container that holds something, but it's not stagnant. It's something, it holds something that flows through it onto other people. So it's a holding area for things that are about to be poured out and a specific reservoir to hold every kind of spiritual wisdom and understanding. Every kind of spiritual wisdom and understanding. Isn't that something you want? It's definitely something I want. Number three, walk in the ways of true righteousness. If we're talking about true righteousness, then there must be a false righteousness that Paul was kind of warning against or pulling away from. And that false righteousness will be something like a feeling or a display of righteousness that comes not out of our relationship with Jesus, but comes out of our own knowledge, our own understanding, our own way of thinking, where we lift ourselves up with a moral superiority over other people. That's false righteousness. True righteousness comes from our connection with the vine. Remember we were talking about that in, in John 15, where if we're connected with the vine, his love, his strength, his encouragement flows through us. So the fruit of our connection with Jesus, the vine, the fruit that comes out of that is really a reflection of who the vine is, who Jesus is. That's true righteousness. There's a book that I've read in the past couple years called Paths of Ever-Increasing Glory by Michael Fickness. And in this book, he looks at the writings of Enoch. And this is what he says, what, one of the things of vision that Enoch got for prayer in our homes. Listen to this. This is the kind of activity that Enoch saw would be in, we would be engaged in. For example, Enoch described the prayer movement that will soon rise in our own homes. And this is a quote from Enoch. And there I saw another vision of the houses of holy people and the resting places of the righteous. Ooh. 
Here I saw with my own eyes that they live alongside his righteous angels, and their resting place was with the holy. And they petitioned and interceded and prayed for the children of men, and righteousness flowed for them through uh, righteousness flowed from them like water and mercy like fresh dew upon the earth. This is how it will be with them forever and ever. That's out of Enoch 39, verses 4 and 5. Enoch saw that our homes would become places of petition, intercession, and prayer and go forth continually. In his vision, and this is, this is from uh, Michael Fickness, in his vision, our homes were so consecrated and holy that angels took up residence with us and righteousness flowed out of our homes like a mighty river. I mean, would that be amazing if our homes became that place where prayer and petition intercession was so um, consistent and at such a high level that angels hung out with us in our homes and they supported us in our prayers and they began to work with us in seeing those prayers come to life. I love this suggestion of how prayer could be established in our homes. And it really is that when you talk about the ways of true righteousness, that would be righteousness in our homes. Number four, please God in every good thing that you do. This may come as a shock to some of you, but the kingdom of God is not all about just kicking back and resting and waiting until Jesus comes to take us to heaven. The kingdom of God is a place of activity. There are things that we do in the kingdom of God. When Jesus was here on earth, there were a lot of things that he did. And those were written about in the Bible. I like what Bob Goff says in his book, Everybody Always. We don't need to just talk about lifting others up in prayer when they're hurting. Actually, lift one another up instead. I don't mean this as a metaphor. Seriously, walk up behind someone, he says, who is hurting and lift them right off the ground. Don't be creepy about it, but do it. You won't just tell them that you're praying for them. They'll know. If you're wondering where Jesus' friends are, just find people whose feet are about a foot off the ground because someone else is lifting them up. We've just found our church. And that's, we can't really have that kind of impact in each other's lives. We really can lift each other up that way. And uh, it, this is a, f a physical demonstration of it. But a lot of times I feel very lifted up just by the things that you say to me and encourage me with. And I hope you do with me as well. Number five, become a fruit bearing branch. Did I hear someone say John 15 again? Here we are. We're talking about fruit, uh, fruit bearing. And um, when we bear fruit, it's because we're dependent upon the vine. We're connected, well connected with the vine. Fruit is just the byproduct of that connection. So when we're strongly connected with the vine, we bear much fruit. There's a lot of fruit that comes out of our lives because what's coming out of us is what's in the vine. And our connection with the vine is strong enough to let the fruit come out of us. So Paul literally prays for them that they would become a fruit-bearing branch. And that's what I want. That's what I want for you. I want you to become a fruit-bearing branch. Number six, yield to his life. What we're talking about here is meekness and humility. The father isn't looking for spiritual robots that will obey his commands in a robotic kind of way, but he's looking for sons and daughters. He's looking for those he can give an inheritance to that he can pour himself out to. Yielding our lives to Jesus is a true sign of lordship. Our yielding to him and making ourselves available to him is really what lordship is all about. There's no other way for us to receive spiritual life than to yield to his life. When we yield to Jesus, we begin to assimilate the life that he has in him. We begin to have life flow in us and through us and out to other people. Number seven, mature in the rich experience of knowing God in his fullness. It doesn't take much imagination for us to understand how far most of us are from this kind of a description of knowing God. Maturing is a process. We grow in maturity. Uh, and it's not, it's, not a, it's not a destination, but it's the process that we go through in our lives that leads us to a deeper relationship with Jesus. I want to always be growing in my relationship with Jesus. I want to be growing in my knowledge of the Father through intimacy with the Son and being empowered by the Holy Spirit. So this prayer that Paul prays that they would mature in this rich, rich experience of the knowledge of God is something that you and I are participating in every day. 
and our prayers for each other in that maturation process are really important. I mean, pray for me that I grow in my the depth of my relationship with Jesus, and I'll pray that way for you too. But it isn't just growing for the sake of growing. It's growing because we want to mature in our knowledge of our relationship with God. Number eight, be energized with all his explosive power from the realm of his magnificent glory. I mean, there's a mouthful. And be energized with all his explosive power from the realm of his magnificent glory. How would you like to have those words prayed over you? To have that destiny spoken over your life? The glory of God is beyond words until you've experienced it. And then the words begin to come and the words grow and they become deeper and, and more meaningful and more representative of who God is. But it's, it's still magnificent. The glory of God is magnificent in its nature. It's huge and it's deep and it's broad and it's wide. And we've been called to not only experience that glory, but also communicate that glory to other people. A lot of times we'll pray for miracles for people. And sometimes it it kind of tweaks me a little bit when people just haphazardly or casually pray for God to do a miracle. I mean, they're miracles for a reason. They're called miracles for a reason. I like what Francis Chan says in his book, Forgotten God, which is about the Holy Spirit. He says this, God wants us to trust him to provide miracles when he sees fit. He doesn't just dole them out mechanically as if one can put in a quarter, pray the right prayer, and out comes a miracle. He says this, miracles are never an end in themselves. They are always a means to point to and accomplish something greater. So when God does miracles, it isn't about just the healing miracle that he's doing or the miracle of restoration he's doing in a marriage. What he wants to point to is the power that comes through that miracle that's available to people every day. We need to be representatives of Jesus who are willing to pour that out to other people, who are willing to make those kinds of proclamations over people's lives, but not casually, intentionally. When God calls us to say a certain thing in prayer or to pray a certain prayer in a specific way, we need to be obedient because uh, there are times when our, our obedience and then the way we pray and the things we pray are key to him releasing a miracle. Miracles are real and miracles happen today, but not miracles are not everyday experiences for the people of God. They're always God's investment into what he's about to do in our lives. Number nine, be filled with great hope. In the Bible, hope is the confident expectation of what God's promised and his strength and his faithfulness to provide that. We have great hope because he's a great God and it really is as simple as that. It's because of who he is, not because we possess great hopes or, uh, hope ourselves, but because he's a great God. That's his nature, and it na his nature generates hope within us. As we look at who he is, hope begins to rise up in us. But we can also pray that for each other, that, that there would be an expectation of great hope in your life, that hope would begin to rise up and you you begin to see yourself as someone who participates with God as he breathes hope into the world around us. So be filled with great hope. Number 10, Paul goes on and he's, uh, this, is, this is an amazing one. He says, I want you to soar with joyful gratitude. <laughs> this is a long ways from don't worry, be happy. This is a long ways from those casual prayers we pray that say, just bless this person. I mean, when we pray, when you pray, just bless them, Lord. First of all, you're saying just bless. Those two words really don't, they don't really fit together. They don't really work well side by side. Just bless. When he blesses someone, it's a, it's a powerful outpouring of his love towards that person. How utterly anemic to just pray, oh, just bless them, Lord. Now, what, 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 he's, call, what he's saying here, what Paul is saying here is, um, pray with joyful gratitude, soar in your prayers, to high levels with joyful gratitude. There must be something of a connection between joy and gratitude. Here, joy is not a thing, but it's describing the kind of gratitude that's not just informative, but it's air experiential, it's full of power, it's full of potential. That's the kind of joy he wants us to soar in, that kind of, that kind of joy in our prayers for each other. Number 11, 
Think of how God made me worthy to receive the glorious inheritance freely given to me by living in the light. Oh my gosh, there we go, living in the light. That is the place we all wanna live every day. By living in the light of his presence, it opens the door for amazing things to happen in me and through me. That's the place I wanna live and that's what Paul is praying for here. Live in this light, live in this place, the light of his presence. Number 12, believe he has rescued me completely from the tyrannical rule of darkness. Sometimes the darkness feels really, really dark. It seems like it's always there lurking in the shadows, waiting for me to let down my guard and make a mistake. It feels like there's a trap being set for me. But what if I really believed that he has released me from that oppression? He's released me from that intimidation. What if I actually believe that I've been rescued and I never had to submit to that oppression again? How much difference would that make in my life? And that's what Paul's praying here. He's praying for uh, the believers in Colossian, Colossia to believe that they've been set free. Maybe that's a prayer that we should pray more often for each other, that we would believe that we've been set free. Number 13, be translated into the kingdom realm of his beloved son. Translated does not indicate a temporary existence. Translated doesn't mean that we are in this place of limbo, but it's a place of movement, a place of movement from one spot to another spot, from one experience to another experience, from the presence of darkness to the presence of light. It's a translated, being translated from a place that's the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of our God. You can see this being played out in the Lord's Prayer. The disciples come to Jesus and they ask him, Lord, teach us how to pray. We've seen you pray. Teach us how to pray the way that you pray. In his book, Simply Christian, N.T. Wright says this. At every point, the prayer, and he's speaking of the Lord's Prayer here, reflects what Jesus himself was doing in his work. It isn't a general prayer to a generalized divinity or Godhead. It isn't even a typical Jewish prayer, though almost every element in it can be matched to Jewish prayers of the period. The prayer is, so to speak, Jesus-specific. He says this, The Lord's Prayer, as we call it, grows directly out of what Jesus was doing in Galilee. So Jesus wasn't just talking about this, but he was doing it. He, the kingdom was about what he was doing. For us, the kingdom of God is an expression of what we're doing in the world around us. How we operate in the world is an expression of the kingdom. Number 14, believe that in Jesus, all my sins are canceled. Well, it's our sins that trip us up. It's simply because they're still our sins. We still claim them. I hear people say this all the time. My problem with this, my difficulty with that, my temptation. They're referring to themselves as having these sins as part of their life. And the reality is these sins have been canceled. <clears throat> Jesus canceled our sins once and for all at the cross, and there's no way of undoing what he did at the cross. Our sins have been canceled. And when you pray for each other, pray that way. That we'd not hold on to our sins, but we'd release our sins and realize that they've been canceled at the cross and that we can move on through our lives. It's a great blessing to be able to give that to each other in prayer. And number 15, finally got to the end. Number 15, he ends by saying, be released into redemption through his very blood. And I, I can't say enough about the power of the blood. It's so significant, so powerful. Our freedom was bought with a price, and it was a significant price. The Father sent his son, Jesus, and his blood was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. Eternal life with Jesus was paid for in the blood. Our redemption was paid for in the blood. It was pur purchased by the blood of Jesus. This truth, if we believe it, and we embrace it, will change our life and it will literally terrorize the enemy. If the enemy sees that he has no hold on us because of what happened at the cross, it really makes us a threat to him. And it will change our lives and it'll cause us to move in such power that we've never seen before. So let's wrap this up. We've talked about 15 different things that Paul said in his prayer that we can receive through praying for each other. And I, my heart is that we, as you sit down and pray for each other, I mean, grab this list, pull it out and say, and, and just pray some of these things for your friends. Pray some of these things specifically for your family. 
Take these prayers that Paul prayed, apply them to your prayers and the way that you pray for your friends and family and see if things don't change. But really what we're talking about is praying not just generalized prayers or praying prayers that fix problems, but we're praying for God to begin to move people towards their destiny. And those are prayers with vision. So these are the type of things I was thinking about as, as I was thinking about praying with vision. First of all, pray knowing that it's an honor to be invited to pray for this person, that it's not out of duty. I don't have to pray for you. When you ask me to pray for you, it isn't, I'm not praying for you because I have to, but it's an honor to pray for you. It's an honor to release you into your destiny. It's an honor to begin to see things uh, in a forward-sensing way for your life. It isn't just about fixing your financial problems or fixing your spiritual problems, but it's about releasing you into the destiny that God has for you. Secondly, pray with an awareness that Jesus likely has this person in a process right now, and you're entering into that process with your prayer. They are in a process of spiritual growth right now. God is growing us up in himself and growing us up spiritually. And so as you pray for someone else, realize that this is not a static prayer at a static moment. It isn't just about fixing a problem they have right now, but it's about where God's taking them. And they're in a process right now. And begin to ask God, how can I cooperate with you, Lord? How can I pray along with you as you're moving this person through a, a spiritual process of maturity? How can I cooperate with you? Then you're not just praying for the problem. And the problems need to be prayed for. But it's not just about the problem. It's not about fixing the thing that's right in front of you. But Lord, you're in the process of moving this person forward in their lives. How can I agree with you and align my prayers with you as you move this person forward? Third, pray with needs in mind, yes. But also pray with destiny as a target outcome. None of us are going to be experiencing what we experience now, a year from now. We will be in a different place with different surroundings, different circumstances, and a different level of maturity in us because of what God's doing in our hearts right now. So as we pray for each other, yeah, you can pray for the needs. You can pray that their, their, the pain in their leg would be healed and believe that God will heal it. But it's not just about them getting, setting, them getting set free from the pain that's in their leg. It's about them being moved forward into their destiny, forward into what God's prepared for them. Just think for a minute. Ask the Lord how you can pray for your friends and family in a way that prays them into their destiny. Where is, where is it you're taking them, Lord? What is it that you're doing in their lives? Help me to pray with you as you move them towards that thing. And then finally this, pray about what you see and know, but don't limit it to what you see and know. Be willing to pray with an expectation for the unseen and the unknown. God will reveal things to you about what his plans are for your friends and family. The people that have come to you with a prayer request for this specific thing, yeah, pray for that specific thing, but there are some things that are unknown to them, unknown to you, and the Holy Spirit will reveal those th things to you as you pray. So it isn't just about what we know, praying for what we know about, praying for what we see, praying for what we hear. But a lot of times we're asking God to reveal the things that are coming for that person, the things that they're about to move into. They may have a new job coming. You can pray for that job. They don't even know they need a job yet, but you've already prayed in a way, uh, in a preparatory way for them to enter into the new job that God has for them. They may be uh, in a very difficult relationship and you can see in your prayers, God begins to show you a healing that's coming to that relationship and they don't even know it yet. And then you talk to them next week and find out they've apologized, they've, they've repented, they've uh, humbled themselves and all of a sudden everything breaks loose in the relationship and you actually saw it the week before and begin to pray into that destiny for them. Some amazing things are about to happen to us. And we can be involved in each other's lives that way. Our prayers for each other are very important. I'm not suggesting that we look past all the things, the natural needs that people have right now and just begin to pray into this, some imaginary destiny that they have. But I really believe that God wants us to agree with him in praying for people to be moved forward in his timing, in his direction, with his encouragement and his strength and his hope. I really believe that if we'll pay attention to what God is saying here through Paul's prayer in Colossians chapter 1, we can begin to pray for each other 
at a much deeper level and a much more intentional way towards the destiny that they have in God. That's my prayer for you. I hope you pray for that me that same way. Don't just pray for me now. Pray for me where I'll be a month from now or six months from now. Don't just pray for Evangel where we're at right now. I expect things to change dramatically in the next year. I believe that we're going to see huge numbers of people come to Christ in this next year because of the effect this pandemic is having on our culture. This isn't just an inconvenience. This is an opportunity to see God move us forward in power and strength, to see God unlock the doors of the church. I am so thankful that we had this opportunity to grow in our relationship with God, to connect with the vine and see fruit come through our lives. But mostly, I'm excited about hundreds of people in our community coming into a new relationship with Christ because they're seeing something that they've never seen before. Let this be a time when we pray each other into our destinies and not just take care of our needs. This is a great time to be alive. This is an amazing time to be a Christian in Longview. And I encourage you to look to Jesus for everything you need, but look beyond your needs and look to the, look to the destiny that you have in Christ. It's a joy to be walking with you. I hope you have a great day, and we'll see you soon.